So thanks for coming. Uh, so as you'll see, the title of this talk is Doctor, NGO Worker, or Something Else Entirely. Which careers do the most good? And uh, rather predictably, it's going to be the something else entirely that we're going to be arguing for, uh, which is a little bit counterintuitive, because normally we think of doctors or NGO workers as the paradigm ethical careers. Um, but I'll give a little bit of background first. So this is brought to you by Giving What We Can. And what Giving What We Can is, it's a society of people who agree and pledge to give 10% of their income for the rest of their lives to the organizations that best fight poverty in the developing world. So the idea is you're taking the problem of global poverty really seriously and asking how can we make the most difference in order to um, benefit those in the developing world. Um, and this is part of a kind of broader question, just how can I do the most good? Um, how can I help people the most? And where we started off with, was with how much good can you do with your money? And we did a lot of research into this, um, evaluating the cost effectiveness of different charities and look, drawing on the research from health and development economics. And we discovered that you can save a life if you um, treat people with tuberculosis using the DOT program in the developing world for about £300. Um, so that's the kind of figure that we're going to use as this is the cost of saving a life. Um, because this is so impressive, uh, a few of us pledged to give a little more than 10%. So I, for example, I'm going to give everything above £20,000 over the course of my life. And this means that uh, solely in terms of my academic salary, by giving everything above £20,000, which is about 50%, um, I'll save 3,000 lives. But the question obviously arises, an academic, you know, doesn't earn much, not compared to what I could have been earning doing other careers. Um, and I could have chosen not to do academia at all. I could have gone into a, a career that's more directly helping people, or something that we more commonly regard as a paradigm ethical career. So we can extend this idea and think, how can I do the most good um, through my, my choice of career, through the career I choose to pursue? So here's a little overview of the talk. So it's going to be in two parts. The first part will be given by me, the second by Ben here. Um, in the first part, I'll talk about how to think about careers. Um, in particular, I'll talk about the kind of standard or common sense view of what makes a career ethical. And I'll suggest that um, there are some mistakes that commonly get made. Um, so normally we think that the most ethical careers in the third sector are directly benefiting people or some public sector jobs, such as being a doctor or a state school teacher. Um, I'm going to suggest that there's some mistakes in this idea and maybe these uh, names won't mean anything at the moment, but they'll be based on indirect benefit, marginal benefit, quantification and martyrdom. Um, these are the four mistakes I'll go through. So um, in part two, then we'll take a more positive angle on the question. So I've been kind of negative in my part, and I've been saying what the mistakes we make. Ben will provide a bit of an upper at the end, and he'll say, well, actually, how can you go into the world? How can you do the most good? Um, so we'll divide this into three categories, money-making careers, research careers, and influence careers. These are all potentially high impact. And we'll come up with a bunch of considerations or key questions as to how you can decide between these. So, part one. We're going to categorize careers into these four areas. So we've got direct benefit, a money maker, researcher, and influencer. And my talk will mainly be on the contrast between the good you can do as a direct benefiter and the good that you can do as a money maker. So in direct benefiters, these are the sorts of careers that you see on careers websites, uh, known as ethical careers. So becoming a doctor, becoming an NGO worker or charity worker, <coughs> whether in this country or the developed world, uh, becoming a state school teacher, uh, social work often gets included, environmental work gets included. Um, some amount of private sector work is included, uh, in particular uh, setting up or working for the social enterprise. It's becoming increasingly recognized as um, an ethical career. Um, and then the three will contest with money maker, so this is all very familiar, becoming an investment banker, becoming a corporate lawyer or management consultant can earn a lot of money. Um, researcher and influencer, Ben will talk more about their potentially high impact careers in research, such as medical research, development economics, 
ethics, um, well, in, in certain areas of ethics at least. Uh, influencer, you can become a campaigner, a teacher, especially at a um, very wealthy school like Eton, um, an academic at Oxford perhaps, um, or a politician. You can have huge amounts of influence, Prime Minister being the most notable example. Um, so my own career, for example, would span both research and influencing. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be that you have to fit into just one of these categories. So okay, I'm going to talk about the standard view. As I've said, according to the standard view, the paradigm examples of ethical careers are the direct benefiters. And I'm going to give you two stories to suggest that this can't be right, that this is the wrong way to think about things. Um, the first story will just talk about harm and benefit in general and suggest that what's morally relevant is not how many people you directly benefit, but it's uh, what you've got to take into account is what would have happened anyway. And then the second story will just apply this um, to the case of career choice. So imagine you go mountaineering and you go with a friend. And suppose that your friend is an expert mountaineer. He's part of the mountain rescue. He's done dangerous mountaineering expeditions hundreds of times and is very well qualified. Whereas you are a complete novice. This is the first time out on a hill. Maybe it's your first time out of London. Um, and now suppose you're walking and then suddenly you realise there's an emergency situation. You see there's a crevasse and there are five people down there and they seem to have fallen down and perhaps the earth gave way, and though unconscious down there. And it's clear that uh, the land is unstable, so you're in a um, time sparse in, uh, situation. You've only got a certain amount of time uh, that you can save these people. And you see there's a path down to where they are, but it's only large enough for one person. Um, and you think there's only time that one person can go and save them and then come back again. And now suppose you reason, well, morality is about benefiting people directly. It's about how many people do I save personally through the tangible benefits of what I do. And you see that your mountaineering friend, he's getting his ropes and his belay equipment together. And you see this, so you push him out of the way. <laughs> and you go down the, to the crevice yourself. Um, you go to the bottom, you grab one person, you carry them up single-handedly, all the way up the crevice. Um, it takes about an hour in total, um, because it's arduous work. And you get to the top just in time. Um, the land gives way, and all the other people are crushed. Um, and your friend's very annoyed with you. <laughs> uh, kind of unsurprisingly. And you, and you respond, well, I did what I ought to do. If I had just waited there for you to go down, I wouldn't have saved any lives. I'd have just been watching. Um, where there's... By doing what I did, um, I've saved someone's life. So I, I've done the right thing. Now, it seems pretty clear that that's not the correct chain of reasoning. And is there anyone in the audience who thinks it is? Okay, because if you did, then you're going to find the rest of the talk crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the important consideration is what would have happened had I not acted as I did? So if this novice mountaineer hadn't gone down the crevice and saved this one life, what would have happened? It's not the case that no one would have been saved. Rather, it's the case that everyone would have been saved because your mountaineering friend would have gone down, he'd have rigged up a belay, and he'd have been able to rescue everyone there. Um, so importantly, that captures the fact that you can actually do harm by directly benefiting people. But the most important um, feature is that Harming and benefiting are comparative notions. You've got to consider what happens given that you act and what would have happened anyway. So now let's consider the second story. Um, suppose that Jo, uh, she's desiring an ethical career and she becomes a doctor working in the developing world. Um, I know there's a doctor in the audience, so I'll just flag up how great doctors are. Um, and suppose that she performs 10 life-saving surgeries every week um, and saves these 10... Uh, beautiful clone children. <laughs> um, now, I've chosen doctors because they do absolutely great work. Um, given what we can, currently recommend medical charities, and I personally currently give a third of my income to medical charities. But the question where 
currently considering is um, did Joe do, um, do the best thing she could by choosing to become a doctor? Well, there's a consideration that su suggests that can't be right. Because suppose that Lorna, um, her friend, she also wants to make a difference in the world. She also wants to help other people. And so she becomes an altruistic banker. And she earns £400,000 per year. Um, this means that she can do donate enough money that she pays for 10 developing world doctors. So in South Africa, the average salary of a doctor is about £30,000 a year. Um, if she gave £300,000 a year, she could still live on £100,000 a year, which is pretty good. Um, certainly more than I'll ever earn. Um, but she could also fund 10 of these developing world doctors. And, of course, each one of these are doing 10 life-saving life surgeries every week. So her impact would be 100, 100 lives per week, which looks like this, plus this. <laughs> um, so that's pretty impressive. It seems like by Lorna choosing to do a doctor, by Lorna choosing to become a banker rather than a doctor, she was able to save 10 times as many lives. So the model of this is that Ways of indirectly benefiting others, such as earning big and donating, can do much more good than directly benefiting. Um, this is slightly counterintuitive, but it's a fact of the world we live in. But the story I gave you, in fact, underestimates the scale of the discrepancy between the doctor and the banker. And this is for a reason that I'll call marginal benefit. So again, as I said before in the mountaineering story, we need to think about what would have happened had you not acted as you did. And what would have happened had Joe not become a doctor? Is it the case that none of those 10 life-saving surgeries would have been performed? Well, that, that seems unlikely. Becoming a doctor is very competitive. Um, there was a larger pool of applicants uh, to become this doctor than um, jobs. And so it seems very plausible, that had Joe not become that doctor, someone else would have done it. And someone else would have been performing those same life-saving surgeries in her place. Now, presumably employers um, are at least fairly good at telling better from worse candidates um, for their jobs. So presumably, the person who would have been working in Joe's place wasn't quite as good as her. And so um, let's suppose that this uh, second person her replacement, would only have saved eight lives. Well, in which case, Joe's still doing good. She's still, there are still two people whose lives are being saved, whose lives wouldn't have been saved otherwise. But it's not as much as one might think if one were only thinking about direct benefit. In contrast, um, Lorna had she not earned and donated the money, um, it's not the case that someone else would have been doing the same thing. Uh, of the people that I know who've gone into banking, uh, very few of them, amazingly few, plan to give away most of the money and fund doctors in the developing world. And so had Lorna not gone into banking and someone else had, almost no money would have been donated at all. Um, for this reason, then, it's not the case that those ten doctors would have been employed anyway. Rather, there would have just been fewer doctors um, performing life-saving surgeries in the developing world. Um, and this means that if she hadn't become an altruistic banker, all 100 people would have died. So the model of this is do something that wouldn't have happened anyway. And if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, I think it should be this. When Ben talks about high-impact careers, he'll talk about a diverse variety of careers. But the one thing that unifies them all is that in so doing this career, or at least in pursuing this career in the way that you do, um, whether that's research, influencing, or making money and donating it, um, you're doing something that wouldn't have otherwise happened. You're um, providing benefit that wouldn't have otherwise been there or wouldn't have been done by someone else.